morning, church. We are blessed today with life, health, and a beautiful day. We also have the opportunity to freely worship our God. We are thankful for your presence, everyone here in the auditorium and everyone that is joining us via Facebook or YouTube. If you are visiting, thank you. Give us the opportunity to meet you at the end of the service. Before we get started, Josh has an announcement. Good morning. I just want to give a real quick plug to our book bag drive. We are going to be starting that uh, back the last two years. We have, we have raised funds and, and put together book bags uh, full of supplies for the students in our community. Uh, the first year we gave out a little over 100 book bags, so we decided last year to raise up uh, that goal and to do 200 book bags. And I think last year we ended up giving out, I think, 225 when it was all over with. Uh, and so this year our goal is 250. So we would love to continue that. We've had, we've had great support from the congregation, not only in raising those funds, but also in putting those bags together and handing them out to the kids. Uh, and it's just been a great effort. So we're going to be starting that again. Uh, and there it was a slide up. Uh, actually, that amount that was on there is, is a little bit different. That should have been changed. Uh, we're actually going to, it's going to be $30 per book bag in order to get the bag and all of the supplies. So if you would like to help out with that, if you'd like to donate uh, for that, uh, to go to that cause, you can uh, either uh, write a check, uh, you can put that in the subject heading book bag drive, uh, you can donate online. So however you want to do that, uh, but we would love for you guys to continue to support that effort. We know that the people in the community have really enjoyed it. And we've been able to do a lot of good things with that. So thank you. Thanks, Josh. To start our service, we read in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold firmly to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let's approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help at the time of our need. Let's pray. Holy Father, you are a merciful and an awesome God. We praise you and give you thanks for everything you do for each one of us. Thanks for this beautiful day and for allowing us to gather today to worship you. Help us do everything according to your will. Remove all distractions and help us concentrate on you. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If it is convenient, would you stand with me for the first song? Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Heart and hold thy heart before thee, open to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the heart of our way. Give her all before God, 
Let us pray. Father, we come to you this day and we are just so thankful to be in your presence. We are thankful that we have the opportunity to lift praises unto your name, to exalt your name on high, and to bow before your throne and worship you in spirit and in truth. We are uh, so blessed to have another day, to have the breath of life in order to go out and to not only teach your word to all the world, but to uh, live by your example and to follow in your footprints the best way that we can. We are uh, prayerful for those who are on our prayer list this morning, and we ask that you be with them, help them in ways that only you know how, strengthen them, encourage them, and uplift them. Be with those who uh, could not be here with us this morning. Uh, bring them back uh, if it be your will and help them to know that they are missed and that they are loved and that without them the church is incomplete and we need them here and we pray that uh, as we continue throughout this worship service that we can do so that it is in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight it's in your son's name we pray amen Thank you, Moises. So glad to see you all today. I hope you brought your Bible with you. You can turn with me to 2 Samuel in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 9. Love the story of Mephibosheth and 
It is such a beautiful story of grace and mercy and kindness and just want to teach it to you uh, today. It is, uh, it's been a great weekend. It's been a busy weekend at, here at uh, this congregation, a lot going on. And, and uh, we were uh, blessed Friday night, had a dad baptized, two of his daughters, and Moise is going to say something about that during our announcements and introduce them. What a great Friday evening that was. And uh, Wayne and Dana were married yesterday, and those of us that uh, participated in that wedding were gifted with pink ties. Stand up there, Peter. And uh, we were gifted with pink ties. And so uh, Peter and I are available for pictures afterwards. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and then uh, the pink also just leads us right into Bridget. Uh, being here and uh, who's having a baby and she's having a yeah girl yeah Whew, boy that was a woo, man anymore you don't know what people are going to say and uh but uh but yeah there are a lot of pink balloons over there it's funny I wandered over there yesterday uh between the wedding and some other things and saw hundreds of balloons being blown up over there and later on I asked hey is Bridget having a boy or a girl and and Kathy uh, McCamus texted back and said, did you see the thousand pink balloons in the... <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm sorry, I just missed it all together. So anyway, a lot of wonderful things and um, so glad that uh, we could especially come together and study together, worship together, sing together, meet around the table together. Y'all, we were blessed. Uh, God's blessed us. I know you got a lot, a lot of things going on in your life some uh, heartache and and uh, all of us do to some extent but uh i think for all of us we can say hey god's been good to us he has blessed us and um and we don't deserve it uh he blesses us anyway and uh he's been good to us and one of the good things in my life is to have friends like you and to have brothers and sisters like you and i appreciate you so much i've entitled the lesson this morning lessons from lodabar Lodabar is not a person. Lodabar is a place. In fact, it is a very desolate place. Uh, the picture, I like this picture that depicts on the PowerPoint um, somewhat the name Lodabar means. It means not having or no pasture. Actually, uh, some scholars believe that the full extent of Lodabar means the land of nothing. It is, it is a place, it was a town so long ago where a group of misfits lived it was a, a, a place of forgotten people. It was a place where people would go and you would not hear from them uh, ever again. It was uh, far away from what uh, would be considered civilization or the big city, and people would go and literally get lost there. The, the place uh, Lodabar is mentioned several times in the Old Testament. It's mentioned here in 2 Samuel several times, and it's mentioned also once in the book of Amos. But originally it's mentioned in connection with the story of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, which is uh, harder to say than you think it is, um, is the son of uh, Jonathan. And Jonathan is the son of Saul. Saul is the first king of Israel before David. And this is where the story comes in because there is a battle that takes place where Saul, Jonathan, and even his uncle are killed in a battle uh, a long time ago, obviously, um, in uh, a place called Mount Gilboa. But according to 2 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4, when they hear, when the nurse hears about the battle that's taken place, and the deaths of the leaders of Israel, the death of Saul and the death of Jonathan and the death of the men on that battlefield, the nurse that's caring for Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth is about five years old at the time, the Bible tells us, she is afraid for him, like a caretaker would be. She knows that next in line to the throne would be someone like Mephibosheth, a family member of Jonathan and Saul. And so the Bible says that she picks up Mephibosheth and she runs with him in haste. She takes him and she's taking him into safety. And when, when she is running with him, uh, she, she drops him. She falls and probably falls on top of him. And the Bible says from that day forward, he is lame, he is crippled in both feet. 
And you'll see that in the earlier parts of 2 Samuel. Years go by, Mephibosheth is not mentioned. Nowhere in the Bible is Mephibosheth mentioned. He is lost in the scripture and he is found in 2 Samuel chapter 9 in a place called Lodabar. And that's where our story comes in, in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And I want to stop right there and just say, I think this is maybe the, the, the point I want to make first in, in this, especially Mephibosheth, has to do with perception before I read a little bit of 2 Samuel chapter 9. I told you that Mephibosheth was dropped and he has, he's lame, he's crippled in both feet. And it is no fault of his own. In fact, he's dropped by someone that's entrusted to him. It's nothing more, the Bible says, is an accident. He's five years old when it happens, and he is living the rest of his days basically being cared for, looked after by uh, other people. Um, the handouts by a few others, in fact, later on, when David is in a battle, he goes back to the same household that Mephibosheth is in, and he gets some rest, he gets some help, he gets some food from the same household. So these are good people living far away, and this is where Mephibosheth finds himself for all of these years. He grows up into adulthood in Lodabar, this land of nothing, and no one hears from him. But I want to make this point. It's not his fault. Not his fault that his dad died. It's not his fault that his dad was killed in battle. It's not his fault that someone dropped him. It's not his fault that he became crippled. It's not his fault that doctors weren't there to the kind of doctors that would help put him back together. I think sometimes we, we just, need to, just need to appreciate uh, people for the fact that, hey, it may not be your fault. I mean, a lot of people carry things around, they have a lot of weight on them, and they blame themselves, or they, 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 there's a, a, a lot of um, weight and heartache in their life, and it's because... They say, well, it's me. It's, it's obviously something I did, something, something that came about in my life because of me, and it may not be your fault. And I also want to say this. We have this tendency to, uh, to want to blame someone. If, if someone is maybe a little, uh, has less than we do, or their circumstances are less than ours, then they probably did something wrong. What is it that they, what happened to them? Folks, it may not be their fault may not be their fault that the company they were working in was downsized. It may not be their fault that they were laid off. It may not be their fault that whatever is happening, there ought to be a little bit of love, right? A little bit of patience, a little bit of kindness. And so here I want to start with the story of Mephibosheth is that it's just, it's just not his fault. And uh, we can appreciate that. I, I, I think I love 1 Corinthians 13. In fact, I use it in most of my weddings. Um, that love is patient, it's kind, it's not jealous, it's not boastful, it doesn't brag, it doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. I love 1 Corinthians 13. But Paul said this in verse 7, love bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things, that love never fails. In other words, love counts on the best. It expects the best. It tries to see the best in others. It, there, there's somewhat of a uh, of a need for not only brotherly kindness but love that that says hey maybe this person is going through this difficult time not because of anything they have done on their own I was helping my son move the other day Kay and I were helping move and he said hey we're gonna I'm, I want to buy you guys lunch and we said yeah you are gonna buy us lunch and uh so we were carrying all these heavy uh, things around and, and so forth and we're going to this place we're just dead tired and as we're going into this place there's this man playing a, it's like this electric violin in, in front of this restaurant and as we walked in um, you could see his wife and a little girl in a stroller and he's playing and he's got a sign um, that it, it asking for some kind of help and people just you know I kind of watch people's reaction to him and to what was going on and and I think for the most part, a, a lot of folks are saying, hey, this, this guy is a bum. He's just doing this, you know, to try to get money. We don't know really what, we don't know what his situation is. I didn't know what his situation, I'd never seen him before, never met him before. But sometimes our first thoughts of someone is, it's their fault, when it may not be their fault at all. 
And I think that today a lot of people are carrying around some things maybe that happened to them, abuse or heartache, that came from somewhere else or someone else, and it's absolutely not your fault. And you need to set it down and put it down and allow God to heal you from that, something that Mephibosheth would eventually, would eventually do. The second thing I want to tell you is that it's a story of commitment. Now I want to read to you the story. This is 2 Samuel 9, okay? In verse 1, David says, Is there anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? I'll explain that in a minute. Now there's a servant in the house of Saul by the name of Ziba, and they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not yet anyone in the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. And so the king said, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Mekir, uh, the son of Emil, in Lodabar. And the king David sent and brought him to the house, uh, from the house of Mekir, the son of Emil, to, uh, from Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, and he fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said to Mephibosheth, uh, said to him, Mephibosheth, and he said, here is your servant. And David said to him, do not fear, for I surely will show kindness to you for the sake of your father Jonathan, for I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul. Shall eat, uh, you shall eat at uh, my table regularly. And he prostrated himself and he said, what is your servant? I love his, listen to his reaction. What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? When a lot of bad stuff happens to you, you don't think very much of yourself. And the king called Saul's servant, Ziba, and he said to him, all that belonged to Saul. Now remember, Saul was a king. All that belonged to Saul and to the, his house, I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him. You shall bring him the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson shall eat at my table regularly. And Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. The story in the latter part of chapter nine ends. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem for he ate at the king's table regularly, and he was lame in both feet. And that brings me to the second thing, and that is not only is this uh, a lesson in perspective, but it's also a lesson in commitment. What, what is it that David's thinking about all these years later? Well, we find out from the Old Testament in 1 Samuel 18 and 1 Samuel chapter 20 that David and Jonathan, because of their friendship, had made a promise to each other. They had made a commitment. And what they had decided, if anything happened to either one of them, that uh, the other one would take care of the one who had fallen or the one who had died. They would look after their family. They would show kindness to their family. So Jonathan said, if anything happens to you, I'm going to take care of everyone that belongs to you, anyone that belongs to you. And David said to Jonathan, if anything happens to you, I'm going to take care of anyone that belongs to you. And they make this promise to each other. But this promise was made a long, long time ago. And so it's sealed, this covenant is sealed, the promise is made, and after all of these years, uh, David is keeping a promise that he made. Carol Burnett, the great comedian and singer, tells a story about a time when she was in college and she was singing and, and uh, she was in this play and some really famous, very wealthy man came up to her and he said, hey, what do you wanna do with your life? And she said, well, I wanna go to New York and I wanna be in these musicals. And he said, why aren't you there? And she said, I don't have the money to move there. I'm trying to save up the money and I, I want to go. And he said, it, it, I'm going to give you the money to go, but you need to make two promises to me. And she said, all right. He said, number one is, you'll never tell anyone who did this. Never tell anyone my name who gave you this money. And the second promise is that when you become famous and you will become famous, you will do this for someone else and you will help other people just like you that are struggling. Carol Burnett said, I spent all of my life and I kept both of those promises. I never told anyone who that man was and I helped people all of my life. I love the story about a man by the name of Colonel Earl Woods. Colonel Earl, Earl Woods fought in Vietnam a lot like my dad did and some of your dads or maybe even some of you sitting in here. And Earl Woods became friends with some uh, South Vietnamese soldiers, one in particular, uh, a colonel. 
And this colonel, this South Vietnamese soldier, saved uh, Colonel Wood's life. And they became very good friends. I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but it was Vong Poon. And Vong Poon had a nickname. And he, the Colonel Wood said, hey, listen, when I have a son, and I'm going to go back and I'm going to have a big family, but when I have a son, I'm going to name him what they call you. And he said, all right, but I doubt you're going to do that. And Earl Wood, Colonel Earl Wood, had a son that plays golf, goes by the nickname or the name Tiger. And that's what they called that South Vietnamese soldier so long ago. It was a promise he made before he even had children. And the reason we recognize the name Tiger Woods, he was given that name because of that promise. God always keeps his promises Do you. The promises that you have made, are you someone that keeps your word? When you tell someone, hey, you can count on me to be there, hey, I'll take care of that, I'll teach that class, I, I, I promise you. And unless something happens, I mean, physically that you couldn't be there, you're the sickness or whatever. But are you someone that someone can count on? I love this story because there's a, a promise that's made that's so long ago that he is still keeping after all these years. Is there anyone in the household of Saul, Jonathan, that I can, that I can bless, that I can show kindness to? Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 2 says, don't make rash promises, don't be hasty in bringing matters before God. After all, God is in heaven and you're on the earth, so let your words be few. Keep your word. Be a person of your promise. Secondly, or thirdly, I believe this is a story of kindness, a story of kindness. David says, is there anyone, in fact, he says it several times, is there anyone in the household of Jonathan whom I can show kindness to? And then when Mephibosheth comes before him, he says, hey, listen, it's because of Jonathan, your dad, I'm going to show you this kindness. The Bible says in the book of Galatians that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. I love what Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 32, be kind, compassionate one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ has forgiven you. My favorite, Titus chapter 3 and verse 4 and 5. Uh, when the kindness and the love of God, the Lord our Savior, appeared. That God is a God of kindness. He is a God of love. Not because of the righteous things Paul wrote be, that we have done, but because of his great mercy. Now, some folks in here are old enough to remember back in the 80s and the 90s, there was a, a business called Blockbuster. And Blockbuster did something, uh, they, you rented tapes from them. They're called VHS tapes. And uh, honestly, I, I thought I'd find one and bring it up here because some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. But a VHS tape was this large tape um, that, that basically DVDs, you know, understand DVDs now. Netflix has taken the place of that. You have no idea what I'm talking about. But there were these giant tapes that you would go rent a movie and you would bring it back to your house and you would stick it in this giant uh, uh, cabinet called a video player and you would watch this movie. And when you took this tape out, there was a label on it and it said, do you remember? Be yeah, some of y'all, boy, we got an old group of folks. We, <laughs> Listen, we were so self-absorbed in the 80s and the 90s that we had to be told that it was kind to rewind. So we even went back in the store like, hey, I rewound this. Like, that was a really big deal. They even made t-shirts that said, be kind, rewind on it. Because our kindness was just rewinding a videotape, which, by the way, was a hassle and uh, why a lot of people... Um, brought it back into the store and said they didn't have time to rewind it because it took about 30 minutes to, re, to rewind. I say all that to say is that, that kindness, we think, well, oh, listen, I'm, I'm kind to people. I, re, I, you know, I, I, you know, I borrowed their lawnmower and gave it back to them. I didn't take it. You know, our level of kindness it, you know, in, our, in a self-absorbed world has gotten really minuscule. What is kindness to you? David said, I'm going to show kindness to the household of Saul. Now, I want to remind you, this is a guy that tried to kill David. This is a guy that tried to run a spear through David. 
He, he was jealous of David. Remember the women sang songs. But, oh, you know, David, he, he kills his 10,000. You know, Saul, he kills his thousands. It wasn't like they didn't sing about Saul. He was so jealous of David, he tried to kill him on several. So this is someone that hated David, and yet he had made a promise to his friend Jonathan, the son of, of, of Saul, and because of that promise, he was going to keep this kindness. It's interesting. When kindness is shown, it's almost a rarity anymore, isn't it? When someone goes out of their way to do something kind for you, or you do something kind for someone, they look at you like, hey, what's your angle, you know? What are you, what are you trying to, what are you, what are you trying to pull on I me? Mean, what do you want out of this? Kind of funny. There's this group called Impro, Improv Everywhere, and it's this improvisation, uh, the improvisation group, and they travel around and they try to do these acts of kindness. And one of the things they do is they show up at airports and uh, they have this, they get a crowd of people together and they show up at airports and they go to where these taxi drivers and limo drivers are. And they look at the sign they're holding up and the sign says, you know, welcome home, you know, Kevin or, you know, Mr. You know, whoever it is, they're picking up a ride. They brought posters with them and they write that name on them and they gather around this taxi cab driver or this limo driver and these like 50 or so people welcome back a total stranger. They have no idea who they are. And when this person approaches, they start cheering and they give them balloons and candy and they, uh, they, uh, they said, at first they're like, what in the world is going on? And then, uh, then they feel like so overwhelmed that someone would welcome them home because we don't even do that anymore. It's interesting, uh, acts of kindness. We have a kindness day now. There's a push for random acts of, of kindness in our world because it's so rare. Tyndale Dictionary says kindness is the state of being that includes the attributes of loving affection, sympathy, friendliness, patience, pleasantness, gentleness, goodness. It is this kindness and probably one of the most profound accounts in the Old Testament of kindness is the kindness that David would show to a, a, someone like Mephibosheth who would literally bring him from a place of nothing and give him a king's house. In fact, he would have, did you notice I, when I read, Ziba not only had servants of his own, he had 15 sons and, and so many servants, so he, all of these people would now serve Mephibosheth. They would look after him, but it wasn't enough that he would eat in his own home, which was going to be a very nice home. He was going to eat at the king's table. This was the kindness that David is showing Mephibosheth. It's so powerful. It is, it is, it's so wonderful. David found Mephibosheth, and he shows him this great kindness in, I think, the highest of honors when he grants him his grandfather's land and his place in the palace. This past week, I, I read about a, a little boy. I think it was in Pennsylvania. He was in the sixth grade. He was graduating from the sixth grade. They got yearbooks. It was one of his first uh, years to ever get a yearbook. Apparently, the school in school with elementary, uh, middle school, and then the, the seniors in high school, this school was sort of kind of combined together. And so they got this yearbook, and he, and he, he, he got his first yearbook, and he came home, and his mom said, hey, um, you know, how'd it go today? And he goes, ah, you know, it didn't go really well, but I guess it's, it's going to get better. And she said, well, wh why wasn't it today a good day? And he said, well, um, nobody wanted to sign my, my yearbook. And uh, so his mom said, oh, that's odd. And she took his yearbook, and she looked in it, and she discovered that he had three signatures in his yearbook. Two of them were teachers, and he had signed his own yearbook, and he had written, I hope next year you'll have more friends. So his mom just sort of wrote about it on Facebook and said, hey, you know, if your son ha is going to get a face, uh, you know, a yearbook, then, you know, try to get a few people to sign it. This is what happened to mine. Just said, hey, just kind of just threw it out there. Wasn't really asking for anything. But one of the, the seniors and another junior in this high school saw what happened to this kid. And not unbeknownst to either one of them, each one of them, a junior and a senior, decided to get their own groups of people and go sign this kid's yearbook the next, the next day. 
And so all of these uh, upperclassmen, you know, uh, and there's uh, pictures, uh, he asked people to take pictures because these good looking cheerleaders came and signed his yearbook. And uh, these guys on the football team came in and signed his yearbook. And then people in his class that had refused to sign his yearbook decided it wouldn't be a bad thing to sign his yearbook. I, I know y'all, to some of you hearing this, it sounds like such a trivial thing. But I'm telling you, a little bit of kindness goes a long way anymore. And you have no idea who is on the edge. You have no idea how defeated some people are that you will meet in life and how your word of encouragement, your act of kindness, will go a long, long, a long, long way. It was an act of kindness. And here's the last thing. It was an act of grace. I think Mephibosheth's reply is unlike any other in the Bible. I'm nothing. Why would you do this for a dead dog like me? I've never amounted to anything. I'm not going to be anything. Nobody even sees me here. In Lodabar, I'm absolutely invisible. Why would you do this for a dead dog like me? I love how this story ends. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, and he always ate at the king's table. You know, I think Jesus wants that for all of us. He wants to bring everyone out of Lodabar, a place of nothingness, a place of sin and heartache. And he wants us to eat at the, at the king's table. He wants to heal the broken and lift up the downtrodden. He wants to heal the addict and set them free, to give hope to the hopeless and joy to those that have no joy, elevate the depressed and build up those that have absolutely no confidence, open doors for those that have no jobs. The Bible says in Romans 5 and verse 8 that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much now than having been justified by his blood, we've been saved to his wrath through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. How much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God wants to restore the years that the locusts have eaten, enable you to go into the enemy's camp and take back what has been stolen. The Bible says in Isaiah that he is wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, that the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I love Ephesians 2 again, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, I love that, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions, by grace you have been saved. Jesus said to all of us, like Mephibosheth, come unto me all the labor and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I'm gentle and lowly of heart and you'll find rest, rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I see myself in the story of Mephibosheth. I think all of us ought to see ourselves there. That we come before the king of kings, you know, not David by the way, but Jesus that he can give us what we cannot give ourselves. Because of the sin in our life, we, uh, we have no, uh, there's a distance, a chasm between us and the king. Yet he comes and finds us and brings us and allows us to eat at the king's table. What a beautiful picture of what God has done for us through his son, that Jesus died for you and for me through the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus that because of that, we can also identify with the death, burial, and resurrection to confess him as Lord of our life, to be baptized into Christ and be raised to walk in a brand new life. We're going to sing in a minute, have thine own way. And certainly that's, that's what we want. We want God to have his way in our life. We, we don't want, it's not our way. It's not our will. It's his way and his will that we want for our life. I promise you, if we'll do this, we'll look at people from a different perspective Maybe not be so judgmental when we see them. Maybe what's going on in their life was no fault of their own. They're carrying a heavy burden around. Maybe by your kindness, you could help them set it down. It's a story of kindness for us, a story of commitment. It's a story of grace. We find all of that, I believe, in the story of Jesus and the story of our life. If we can help you this morning become part of that great story. We want to do that. I'll be here at the front. Another elder will be with me. If we can help you in any way, we want you to come while we stand and sing, Have Thine Own Way.
Brother Alino Mitchell comes this morning and asks for prayers on behalf of his daughter who graduated from high school and she's going to be going in the fall to study in Panama but before that she's going on a school trip to Europe this summer and he asked for a safe journey. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that we enjoy in our life. We thank you for our children. We pray that you'd watch over Alino's daughter and and their entire family. They're such a blessing to our family here. We pray that you'd be with her throughout her trip this summer and as she studies later in the year in Panama. Be with her and keep her safe. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Evelise Matos uh, comes today, Moises' uh, wife, and says, hey, pray for me. Pray for our family. Um, Evelise's mom's been diagnosed with dementia. Her dad's very sick. Um, two of her three daughters are going to go live in, in, or living in two different directions. And uh, they care for a, a woman by the name of Joan, and they have for a while. And it, it's uh, a longtime friend of theirs. And now Joan has dementia, and she has no one that's kind of looking after uh, her affairs and, and so forth other than them. They got a lot on them. And, um, y'all, they, they don't come much better than the Matoses, okay? And uh, we love them here, and uh, they do a lot of stuff for folks behind the scene, and they're an encouragement to a lot of people. And uh, we just uh, love them. One of the great joys that I've had of 30 years of preaching here has been serving as an elder for over two years now with Moises and Scott and Ted. And uh, they're really, really uh, wonderful men. I want to pray for them. Father, thank you today for your love. We thank you for uh, the Matos family. And uh, just ask that you bless them, give them good wisdom as they continue to make choices, help them lift up their family. I know uh, Valise has got a lot on her with her mom, uh, dementia, and her dad being very sick. And, uh, and then, you know, the concern of your, your daughters moving away and, and living. And I pray for them. They'll just keep making great decisions and, and living for you. And then I pray for Joan. And uh, to have someone uh, much uh, like Mephibosheth, who uh, is, really has no one to care, though, for them. Um, and the Matoses have been looking out for her. And I know when she was able, they could bring her to services when she was able and and, uh, and now it's, it's gotten so much more difficult. Just bless them as they care for her and make good decisions for her health and, and, uh, and her future and watch over them. And Lord, it's, it's just a reminder that for all of us, we just don't know what other people are going through, the weight that they have in their everyday life. And uh, we want to thank you for helping us get through day by day, blessing us. There are some folks sitting in here with they got a financial burden or a relationship burden. They're going through a tough time in their home and their marriage. It's folks going through maybe a difficult time on their job. Just help lift that burden. Strengthen them and bless them, Lord. Remind them that they how valuable they are and how loved they are by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
being commanded on the night he was betrayed to remember him. We're going we're gonna to follow that command now, and we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. The bread he gave, which represents his body that was given to us, and then the blood he shed on the cross at Calvary so that we could have forgiveness of all our sins. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings we do enjoy. The privilege to come here and follow your commands to worship you on the first day of the week and to continue in the command of your son Jesus to remember him. We ask, Lord, that you watch over us to partake now in a way that's acceptable in your sight. And we can just be honor Christ and honor his, his sacrifice of his life so that one day we can have a home in heaven with you. Forgive us when we fail you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue in prayer. We come again, dear Lord, thanking you for the fruit of the vine. It represents to us Christ's blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. Again, dear Lord, let us think on these things and understand what we're doing. And we thank you again for forgiveness through that blood of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. At this time, we also have an opportunity to give back. And we have different ways that we give now. You can place a check in the box in the back. You can give online. But the main thing is that we're cheerful givers. And that we're willing to take of what the Lord's blessed us with and give back so that the cause of Christ can be spread in our mission field and that the work here is able to be done. Let's pray together again. Most righteous Heavenly Father, we can't thank you enough for watching over us, taking care of us, providing more than our everyday need. We know, dear Lord, we go through difficult times, but in the big scheme of things, we know you're in control. And we ask you bless the funds that are given this week that they may serve the cause of Christ and the word may be spread in our mission fields. That the kingdom may be glorified, Christ may be glorified, and the church may grow. Forgive us again, dear Lord, when we fail you. Help us do what's right in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so thankful for your presence today, everyone who joined us online and all of you here in the auditorium. We're going to have a closing song, then a prayer, and then have a seat, and we're going to have a few announcements. If you can join me standing for the closing song.
Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this uh, beautiful day we've had to come worship you, to sing praises in your name. We just thank, thank you for this opportunity. We hope that it's been good. We ask that you be with those that are in need, those that have been mentioned, that you'll wrap your loving arms around them and uh, just comfort them in the ways they needed. We ask that you be with us as we leave here. Keep us safe. Bring us back. In Jesus' name, amen.